Great. So welcome, everyone. Welcome oh, oh. to all of you here at the House of European History. It's great to see you. This is the first time that I am moderating an event live with you at the European, at the European House of History. My name is Chris Burns. Uh, I've done a lot of these uh, events uh, with the House of European History, and now it's in person and it's with you, and also with those of you out uh, in the audience online. This is the series Through the Lens Of, and it's about Christmas in the trenches of World War I. And to be able to see that through the lens, we're going to be talking to Alan Wakefield, who is a historian. At, he's the head, Alan, you are the head of the First World War and early 20th century conflicts at the Imperial War Museum, okay? And through your lens of looking at the letters of soldiers on the front line, what did they send home? We're gonna look at some of those letters. And um, I, I wanna quickly mention though that both of us are joined at the hip with this story because our relatives in this world war. My, both my grandfathers, my American and French grandfather, Grandpa Auguste and Grandpa Otis, I was too young to know what they did. So for me, it's a discovery today, along with uh, Alan, whose uh, relatives part inspired him to get involved in doing this uh, as well. Uh, before we go on, a um, couple of tech tips. Your questions, and I want to get to your questions here in the audience. We've got a roving mic, and also out, all of you out there online to send in your questions via the YouTube chat. And Blondine is going to send me the, those questions. And then uh, keep in mind the hashtag. Please do, if you think of a good comment to make or you hear a good sound bite from Alan, send it out, hashtag through the lens of, through the lens of. And uh, you might throw in the handle uh, of Historia Europa. That's the one. Historia Europa is the handle for this house of European history you should come and visit it. It's absolutely amazing. Before we go on, let me invite Kieran Burns, curator of the House of European History. Uh, you're online, Kieran, there. And um, I just mentioned that I'm Chris Burns, you're Kier Kieran Burns, but there's no relation here. Not that we know uh, of. But Not you know what? Know. One of these days we got to do Burns Night together and have some Yeah, absolutely. Today. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Go for it. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Chris said, my name is Kieran Burns. I am a curator with the House of European History. I have been since 2011. And I am fortunate enough to be in charge of, among my responsibilities, our, our gallery on the First World War. So hence my contribution to you today. So on behalf of myself and all of my colleagues, the team at the House of European History and our director, Constanza Itzel, uh, I, like Chris, would like to welcome you all here today um, and to thank you for coming, to thank you for coming there on the sixth floor of the House of European History in a sunny and not so windy Brussels, and also to all of our um, visitors coming online today. Um, our online presentations, although born out of necessity through the, the, the COVID pandemic, are also a chance for us to reach an audience uh, both nationally and internationally, who physically, for whatever reason, cannot come to Brussels. So we are delighted today to have this hybrid event in place. And as I said, our friends um, out there on the World Wide Web. So um, I am delighted to be able to introduce Alan Wakefield for you today. Um, Alan is a, a distinguished historian and curator with the Imperial War Museum. Um, I'm delighted to do that because um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, Alan will talk to you today in part about the, the, the lived experiences of soldiers uh, at, at the front in this context at Christmas time. And that emphasis on the kind of the, the human dimension, the lived experience, the idea that the Imperial War Museum has always expressed that war shapes lives is very close to the approach that we take at the House of European History. We are, as some of you may know, I'm repeating myself, please forgive me. We are a museum of transnational European history. We take a bird's eye view on Europe's past. 
we don't tell the story of 28 or 27 individual member states of the European Union. We tell the story of the points where history is common, where there are points of contact, where there are shared experiences. In the long journey of putting the House of European History together, we had a number of guiding principles. We would look at events which had originated in Europe, or phenomena which had originated in Europe. We would look at things which had spread more or less throughout the whole continent, and we would look at things which were still relevant today. I think probably nowhere are those three criteria as relevant and as true as when we talk about the First World War. Um, it is a conflict which originates in Europe, spreads throughout Europe through its colonial connections uh, far and wide, and it, it spreads beyond Europe. And of course, we cannot deny that it was relevant not only in subsequent generations of European history after the war, but also is still relevant today. The other reason why I'm really happy to have Alan here today is that in our long journey in the House of European History, the House has been lucky to have the support of many different museums across Europe, among them the Imperial War Museum. So when you finish your lecture today uh, up on the sixth floor, take a trip down to the second floor and have a look at the First World War galleries and you will see some very fine objects on loan to us from the House of Europe or from the Imperial War Museum to the House of European History. So a little personal thank you on that regard um, that, you know, we had very good support uh, from all our museum partners who got our project and, and understood the idea of telling World War I through a, a trans-European dimension. Now, before I hand back to Chris, who will then hand uh, directly to Alan, I will just tell you a little bit about Alan's background because I think it's important. We are very lucky to have such a distinguished speaker. Alan is, as Chris said, head of First World War and early 20th century conflict at IWM where he leads a curatorial team charged with interpreting and developing the hugely uh, varied collection of material covering the period 1900 to 1929. Alan is a recognised authority on the British involvement in, in the Salonika campaign from 1915 to 18, and has lectured and contributed to publications in the UK, Greece, Russia and Serbia, and Serbia on aspects of the campaign and other First World War related subjects. Alan is the chair of the Salonika Campaign Society and a member of both the British Commission for Military History and the Western uh, Front uh, Association. His most recent publications um, deal with the First World War in focus, rare and unseen photographs, and an education onto itself, or an education in itself rather, the British military mission to South Russia, 1918 to 1920. And also Alan is the author of The British Way in Warfare, Salonika 1915 to 1918, uh, which is published in 2018 and is one of the most significant and one of the rare comprehensive histories on the history of this campaign uh, in Britain. So Alan will talk to you today about something which we know from culture and from history uh, and from something as mundane as a Paul McCartney song from many, many years ago. And that is the, the famous Christmas truces which come, uh, which occurred on, on the Western Front. Alan will talk to us today about themes such as fraternization with the enemy, food and drink, entertainment and contacts with civilians. So very much, as I said, the human dimensions. So I finished my piece, I'll hand back to Chris and then he will talk to Alan. So Chris and Alan, the virtual floor is yours and I hope you have a very enjoyable afternoon. Thanks. Karen, thank you very much. And uh, I, I have to note, of course, that, that you can't stay with us the entire time. So um, we will bid you goodbye now, just to make sure that we can do that. And th what's important about th this, this event uh, in, as, as part of the House of European History is that we're bringing history to life and and what more so what can we put to that than w the looming conflict uh, between Ukraine and Russia at the moment and and I guess this kind of an event helps us think a little bit more about the troops uh, who are involved these are young 20 something guys and what they're thinking what they're going through is something we can talk about now what happened way back in the First World War. Let me, before I go to Alan, I'd like to play this video that I found. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. 
to kind of uh, give us sort of the, the dramatic aspect of it before we start looking at the letters. Let me share this screen. I hope this works. See all that? Everything fine? Here we go. Okay. Have a look. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'll play just part of it. Are we getting sound? Oops. Those of you here, here in the audience, I know you're not hearing the, it's, it's music, basically. Are you seeing the images here? Uh, okay. All right. Stop that. And in any case, um, obviously, this was quite a moving account, a visual account, a dr dramatized, of course. And uh, although, Alan, as I come to you, stop the share here. Hold on a second. Same time here. Stop share. Okay, stop sharing. It should be us again. Um, I think this helps to dramatize and show what was going on at the time. And, and let's put this in context, too, that this was six months into the First World War, right? It started in July 20, uh, 1914. This is December, right? barely six months away, but the, the fast advance that had been happening up to that point where the Germans were hoping to race to the, the sea were stopped by the Allies. 
This is where it descended into a trench warfare. This is where I wish I could have talked to and uh, about this, but this is where we'll hear from the letters about this, that now they're stuck in the trenches. It is cold. It is snowing. It is frozen. That's the context of it. As to you. Hey, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, interestingly, that, that video made for a, a British supermarket and one of the Christmas ads that comes out every year was um, a lot of the people involved in that. I actually know them personally. And and the reason uh, for the, 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 the British cap badges which are being worn there and the reason that it just doesn't just show football was through a couple of the historians that were involved in it who, who basically nuanced the story and put in some actual factual references into that um, a particular advert to actually make it more akin to what actually did happen in the uh, Christmas truce of 1914. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen. Right, yeah. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about Christmas in the First World War. And, and, and as Chris has said, this is from a, a, a British soldier's perspective. It comes from uh, reference work that I did in the archive at the Imperial War Museum for my, I'll just give my book a plug, my book, Christmas in the Trenches, um, which looks at letters diaries, memoirs, and photographs, et cetera, left behind by soldiers, which have ended up in public archives, mainly the Imperial War Museum in the case of my, my research material. Um, and what we know is, of course, that initially the First World War was supposed to be over by Christmas 1914. That was the whole thing. Why people flocked, a lot of people flocked to join up quickly so they wouldn't miss this what they saw as a, would be a great adventure, but it would be a short war. No, very few people saw the war going on for years and years. But in total, the, the First World War goes over five Christmases because we have to really include 1918. So although the guns have fallen silent by Christmas 1918, most of the soldiers uh, are still in uniform. Um, and there are British soldiers and French Americans on occupation duty in Germany, Austria, uh, and um, Bulgaria at the time. So there are still many men out there. So we, we include Christmas 1918 within that sort of Christmas mix. And if we look where British troops were involved in actually fighting, well, British and Empire troops, I should say, 1914, we're on the Western Front, France and Belgium. We're also in Africa, uh, out in the Pacific. Uh, and in Mesopotamia, modern day uh, Iraq. 1915, the war spreads again, where the Gallipoli campaign is on, and British and French troops land in Salonika in northern Greece. 1916, the war spreads to the Middle East with Egypt and then Palestine. British troops go to Italy in 1917. And then 1918, we've got the intervention in Russia and those occupations of the, of the defeated uh, central powers. And Christmas is obviously a, a you know the, these these men are away from home for a long period of time, and Christmas really gives you an opportunity. It's a time when you start to really miss your family and friends, and um, this is why Christmas is very important to to soldiers and why the army um, and individual groups of soldiers and friends try to make Christmas a focus when they can sort of forget about the war. They can forget about the fact they're away from family and friends, they can forget about the fact they're in terrible living conditions, very basic food, very basic shelter, and try to do something to remember what life was like uh, before they went to war. And um, because, Alan, if I can just jump in here real yep. quick, is that um, it isn't isn't soldier morale an extremely important part uh, of any kind of a, a campaign? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, without 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 good morale, um, 
your, your army is 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 not worth much you you need your troops you know you could be fantastically equipped but if your men are not prepared to to basically fight either for the cause they're they're supposedly fighting for or for the, the regiment or for the man standing alongside them your army isn't worth anything your army will we saw collapse. which we saw toward the end of this war yeah yeah we yeah we did we we saw that with the central powers when there were there was lots of of pressure undermining uh those central empires uh, the german empire the austro-hungarian empire in particular where nationalism was taking hold and the whole thing was splintering and yeah the morale was 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 basically going um never happened with the british army though, surprisingly enough throughout, throughout the whole war the british army was never really um up against really poor morale even even though it fought some horrendous battles um the british morale stayed pretty steadfast to the end the soldiers had the idea that the war had to be carried through to victory, no matter how hard that would be. So I'll just give you a quick. Um, this is this is my letter of a, a, a captain in a, in, a, in a Gurkha battalion, Captain Herbert Wynne, and he was in hospital in Mesopotamia. So this shows it doesn't matter where you are in the world and, and what your situation is. Um, you are thinking of your family at home and what Christmas was like. And this is pretty typical of, of what you find in soldiers' letters. So this is from 1916. And he said, I have plenty of time to think yesterday and today lying here doing nothing. And my thoughts have turned homewards to past Christmases. I've seen myself waking up early in the morning and getting out of bed to receive my presents and, ex and give an exchange when funds ran to it. I've seen myself singing Christmas carols in the old parish church and the old vicar with his fine voice and happy phrases wishing his parishioners a Merry Christmas. I have seen myself coming home and eating goose and savoury pudding, followed by numerous chocolates. I have seen myself relapsing into a state of coma, finally emerging to have a piece of Christmas cake at tea and so on to a Christmas party. Well, even next year or the year after, I hope that sort of Christmas will happen to me again. The actors will be older, but the spirit, spirits will be there. And that's the main thing. Well, here's to that next merry meeting. May it come sooner than we hope. And that's pretty typical. You find that in lots of soldiers' letters, um, even when they're writing in their diaries really to themselves, not for wider broadcast. It is this thought that, OK, it's tough this Christmas, but I'm thinking about what we did at home and perhaps next Christmas we'll be back there. And of course, um, the receipt of of um, gifts from home, the Army Postal Service is, is fantastic in the First World War and millions of letters and parcels find their way to soldiers all over the world. And um, these these include food, so cakes and things are coming through the post. So people are actually getting that sort of that taste of home that is actually coming out uh, to soldiers, even though it may turn up one or two months after Christmas, um, because it takes a long time for a for a um, for a parcel going by ship to reach somewhere like um, uh, Palestine, for instance. So that's a real thought to to sort of hone people's minds into into Christmas. Um, the other thing we have to think about is uh, okay. So Christmas is technically Christmas is twenty fifth of December. Now the thing is the war doesn't stop, so you have to have troops in the front line, manning the trenches, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. So what tended to happen is that Christmas was celebrated in the two to three weeks around Christmas. So if soldiers knew they were going to be in the trenches at Christmas time, they would generally celebrate Christmas before they went in. OK, um, if they were in the line at Christmas, they would celebrate when they came out. So that two to three week period around Christmas Day was when the celebrations happened and spread out really whenever the men had a, had the opportunity to actually do something um, maybe maybe i can uh, add i'm not sure if um how much this played a factor but I, I understand that the weather was a factor because up to that point there was terrible rain and at that point it uh, after it uh, got colder it, the the soldiers were allowed to dry out a little bit and uh, the morale at that point was more conducive to some kind of celebration, right? 
Yeah, what 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 happened was that the where the British were holding the line, which is so south of um, Ypres in um, Belgium, about thirty miles down to the French border, um, the whole area was turning into a basically a, 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 a just a basically a mud bath because the drainage system across that that landscape had been destroyed by the war, and um, what was happening is the trenches were flooding, the trenches were collapsing, um, and the actual ability to fight somebody was was grinding to a halt with just soldiers just having to be able to like repair trenches repair living quarters etc and what started to happen was little ad hoc truces of opposing regiments so troops would start to come out of the trenches and start to work openly on repairing their their trench network and both sides would do this and uh, wouldn't actually shoot at each other i mean this this photograph for instance here shows Scottish soldiers actually repairing trenches in the open. The trees you see in the background, that is where the German front line is. But nobody is opening fire on them. The conditions, the conditions are so appalling that both sides are allowing each other to actually just basically have, have some sort of better life. And this is, this, this is what became known as the live and let live system. The idea that if you're just holding the line, you're not involved in any large fighting, any large battle, the idea is that life is so uncomfortable that why make it worse by trying to kill each other? So the actual level of violence actually drops. And obviously, as you mentioned there, Chris, that in the winter, because of the worst conditions, there is a more of, of an impulse to actually bring this sort of live and let live system into play. And this, 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 this happened in, in um, Christmas 1914. And although it was very wet up until Christmas, on, on Christmas Eve, there was a really uh, sharp frost and the ground was uh, basically froze solid. So that allowed people to the next day to actually go out into no man's land. Uh, it was actually it. people were able to move around because the mud wasn't such so much of, a, of an issue. Um, I've got a quick account here of a chap um, who heard the Germans on, on, on um, Christmas Eve 1914. Uh, this was a major Henricus, um, doesn't sound too English, but uh, he, he, he was, obviously his ancestry wasn't, but he was in the London Regiment, which is a, a territorial battalion, and they were in the line um, on the 24th of December, and he said this in his, um, in his memoirs. As darkness came on, lights were seen in the German lines. At first, our fellows fired at them and the Germans put them out. Gradually, the firing died down and all the enemy sniping ceased. Silence was almost uncanny, and we were very suspicious and extra vigilant, expecting some trick. Later on, lights again began to appear in and behind the German lines until it was completely illuminated. I think they'd hoisted lanterns on tall poles on their parapets at their trenches. After that, they began singing, finishing up with the Watch on the Rhine and the German and Austrian national anthems. They sang beautifully. The whole effect was weird in the extreme. They then started shouting remarks across to us, to which we replied, but I couldn't really hear what was being said. I think everyone felt very homesick on Christmas Eve. Thoughts of our families, thoughts were with our families at home. The night passed without a shot being fired by either side. Our sentries were, however, extra vigilant, and I felt quite uneasy at the strange silence. So it's it sort of gone up that notch now. They've sort of gone into conversation with each other, so to speak, via the, via the singing. Because um, we've got to think about trench warfare. Now, trench warfare, you don't normally see your enemy because if you put your head up above a trench parapet, somebody's going to try to shoot you. So the idea is, although these people are only probably 100 metres or so away, you very rarely ever see the people you're supposed to be fighting. So there's a there's a people are very interested in who are these guys over the, over in that other trench and i think that's one of the reasons why this truce uh why so many people get involved in this truce there's about thirty thousand british soldiers involved in this truce in 1914 and i think part of it is that sort of being inquisitive about you know who is over there who are the germans we've been told that they're you know beastly horrible people but is that actually but it would be nice to actually meet some of them and i think that's that was one of the reasons why why people really wanted to go and get involved in this 
So on, on Christmas Day itself, so we've, we, we, we've got this thing where they've established these sort of friendly relations now. Yeah. Just singing and shouting across. Um, and it sort of goes up a notch the next day. And um, Pri Private Jack Chapel um, was one of the soldiers who actually went out and met the, the Germans. And this is what he recalls on his part of the line. He said, on Christmas Day, the Germans shouted that if we refrained from firing at them, they would do the same. We did so, and people started showing themselves over the trenches and waving at each other. Shortly, two Germans advanced unarmed towards our trenches, so our men went out to see them. They met halfway and shook hands, exchanged cigarettes and cigars and souvenirs, and soon there was quite a big crowd between the trenches. Russell was introduced to a German who had been a barber on the Strand in London. Another German asked Russell in good English where, where, if he would like to go home. And Russell asked him where he lived, and the chap said London, and that he would like to return there very soon. Both sides then buried their dead, whom they could not get to before this. After which, the Germans were ordered back to their trenches. Both sides continued to show themselves, however, and hold conversations. And when we were relieved this morning, not a shot had been fired by either side in the trenches, though we could hear firing on both flanks, and the artillery were bombarding each other over our heads. So th this is pretty much what you were seeing in that um, Christmas truce. Um, there, there are two points, Alan, that, that come to mind. One is, could these letters have served, they probably did, as intelligence gathering, that every, every soldier was almost like a citizen journalist who was reporting from the front line what the situation was, uh, and that you could also gauge the morale of the troops from the standpoint of the letters that they wrote. Um, so th that's one observation that I, I'm wondering about, you know, what do you think about? But the, and the other one is about censorship. And obviously the letters were read, right? Before they were sent on to the families. And to what extent were those letters censored? What, do you, what did you see? How much was-, was Yeah. Out? Um, and for what reason? Yeah, the, but in the, British, in the British Army, the idea is that your, your officer, so your your the, the nearest officer to you. So if you're in a in a in a in a, in a company, your company officer would read all of the letters of the soldiers, and would would cross out. Um, or actually, I've seen them where they've got a pair of scissors and cut out things that shouldn't have been said. And it's normally things about where where you're located. So you're not allowed to name a particular village or town or whatever. Um, Anything about, yeah, morale wise, you know, or we've suffered lots of casualties. It's really, you know, that sort of thing isn't norm, doesn't normally go through. But in 1914, those those sort of things weren't, weren't as well in place as as they were later in the war. So some of these letters were getting through and getting home. Also, soldiers were going home on leave early in 1915 and were talking to the local newspapers. So accounts were actually being published in local papers of the fraternisation. Some of the photographs that were taken during the truce, um, such as this one, ended up in newspapers. And uh. this was one of the reasons why, uh, in the British Army especially, they, they banned uh, ordinary soldiers from having cameras on the Western Front, because this was not good for, this is not good for, you know, this is, you know, we, Sort of the, the the propaganda war is going up, and we're saying, "Oh, the sure. Germans are really horrible. They're you know they're bayoneting babies and, and and whatever you know, burning down Belgian towns, shooting people everywhere." And the fact that we've got British and German soldiers arm in arm with each other sort of undermines that idea that 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 they're not all basically the same. You know, they're not all just soldiers just doing what soldiers do. Um, so so it has a big effect that way. Um, what we also find is that a lot of officers, especially professional officers, they're particularly worried that they've got involved in this truce. So what they do is they send to, to the generals um, lots of information, as you said, Chris, um, about in, how useful this truce is as an intelligence gathering exercise. So there's lots of reports saying, oh, we looked at the Germans, we noticed their regimental numbers were, you know, 10. They had um, green piping on their uniform. They appeared to be um, very well fed, quite fit. They were young men, et cetera, et cetera. All this sort of stuff gets fed up the line. And it's almost saying, 
that's you know, important uh, information. You know, we're not really we're yeah. not really fraternizing with people. We're, we're we're using this as a way to to actually um, enhance our intelligence. Even newspapers, which are swapped with with German soldiers, end up at headquarters as a, an indication of what morale is like on the German home front and what their view is of the British as well. So yeah, one other, one other uh, interesting aspect, because you and I had a little discussion ahead of this, was uh, the, the fact um, that there was a code that some of the soldiers developed with their families in terms of using certain words or letters or what so that they could truly communicate to their families and get around the censors. Yes, yeah, that's yes, that's right. I mean, we, we've we've got letters in the collection where obviously what's happened is somebody's gone home on leave, and has and has worked out the code with his family to say, look, if you take in 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 the, in the fourth sentence of my second page in my letter, if you if you take every third uh, letter in every word, it will spell out the town that I am currently um, nearby. So there were there were these sort of codes going on. Um, other people had them where they they the, the the word would be sort of traced through the letter through the words um, or particular phrases, as you said. Um, and 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 and, we, and we've got some of those examples in the collection. Luckily, we were told the code as well. Otherwise, we we would be uh, none the wiser that we actually had those codes in the in 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 the uh, collection as well. But yes, ingenious how people got around um, the military rules, um, and I think that's that that went for old professional soldiers especially. As and I think with this truce, lots of the soldiers who are there are. This is before the the, the British conscript army really goes to France. This is primarily British regular soldiers and British part-time territorial soldiers who have taken part in this truce, and I think this is. You might argue, well, surely professional soldiers wouldn't do this. This would be more like civilian soldiers doing this. But the, I think the British professional soldier always wants to make his life a little bit more comfortable. So I think getting something like this truth where you can shut down the war for a day or so um, and, and, and engage in this sort of fraternisation was, was just the sort of thing that a lot of British professional soldiers would have been interested in getting involved in. Alan, is yeah. this a good moment to take a couple of questions? Because we're about a half an hour into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another yeah. 60 minutes ahead, but we've got so much material to go yeah. through. But first, uh, but I'd like to keep the audience involved. So if there, is there anyone uh, either out there you can send through the YouTube chat uh, or you can, uh, oh, anyone in the audience, if you want to raise your hand, we got a roving mic. We've got a question to, to ask Alan. Yes, please. Give us, give us, no, we'll, we'll bring you a microphone. And uh, everyone else, keep an eye, keep keep in mind uh, hashtag through the lens of that's T H R O U G H the lens of. If you want to have if you want to send out something on a hashtag on the on the social networks, or also keep in mind the the handle for the House of European History where we are right now, the at Historia Europa at Historia Europa. And please, yes, give yeah. us your name first, please. Sure. My name is David Garrahy. Um, I, I, um, you mentioned about the generals and their reaction to it and, and the officers. Um, what, was, what was the official reaction of the British military command when, when the story of the Christmas truce started coming out? Did they condemn it or did they try to ignore it? Excellent question. Alan, please. Yeah. It it's it's mixed surprisingly it's mixed um, i've got a couple of examples in um there's a report that goes to one of the core commanders and it says that that one one of the divisions within his core basically told the germans get back in your trenches we're going to open fire but the commander of the other division actually extends the truce to the 20 the end of the 27th of december because he says this is a really good opportunity to go out into no man's land bury the dead which we can't get to normally and to repair and drain the trenches um so there's very much um a mixed reaction right at the top it's taken very seriously on on both sides and they think that this could end up as a general sort of soldier's truce because there is a there is quite a fear amongst some of the 
the political and military elite of 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 the rise of potential international socialism especially if we've got a lot if the army is expanding out and we're withdrawing in lots of elements of society into the army so there is this fear that that the war we won't be able to start the war up again um there aren't there are very few if any british soldiers who who actually go along with that idea but in terms of the officers on the British side, it, it is a mixed it is a mixed reaction. They know the war needs to start up again, but they see it as a useful a useful tool to improve their defences and perhaps yes, do a little bit of spying on the German lines, find out what the Germans are about. Um, but it is mixed. Uh, Alan, I, I understand that uh, the reason why there were not others like that in the in the subsequent years was that there was an effort from uh, both sides of the conflict to prevent it from happening. In other words, shelling, snipers, that kind of thing uh, around uh, the, the holiday period to make sure that there wasn't that kind of partying yeah. together anymore, right? Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, um, in, in a sort of around New Year's Day in, 19, in 1914 and 15, and then at Christmas 1915, both the British and German army send, send out um, army level orders saying that any fraternization or meeting with the enemy will be seen as um, either treason on the German side or it will be a court martial offence on the British side and it could be seen as desertion which means you could be shot if you were found guilty. So there are lots of high level sort of potential sanctions put in place. There is a lot of this ordering all levels saying that you you know the officers must stop this from happening again in 1915 yeah. and there is a lot of stuff to say yeah get the artillery firing get the machine guns firing keep it going keep it going I, I, just one other historical aspect that I, where i'm joined at the hip is my august's brother Marius, was missing in action and we don't know what happened to him whether he deserted or what but uh he disappeared but, uh, we have a question yeah. over here, please. Hi, my name is, <clears throat> my name is Alessandro Di Maio, and I have a question um, related on this issue. These kind of episodes were occurring only on the on the Eastern Front, or also on other type of fronts, like for example, the Italian and the Austrian Front. Mm. Yes, uh, Alan, I think you you gathered a lot of information on that, didn't you? Yeah, the, um, there are things like this going on. I mean, I, as I say, I mean, I've looked at this primarily just from the, the, the British Empire side of things, but there are quite a few um, truces uh, between German, Austrian and, and Russian soldiers on, on quieter parts of the Eastern Front, especially in 1917, when Russia is sort of the Russian army is collapsing in, through, through the revolutions in Russia. Then there are there are quite a few German official photographs of Russian, German, and Austrian soldiers dancing. Um, obviously taken for they were official photographs, so taken for like propaganda purposes, really. But it but that is happening. Um, not so sure about the on the Italian front um, because, as I know, that the, with the Italians, um, with the Austro-Hungarian army, the, the, the big issue with the Austro-Hungarian army was the massive mix of populations they had and. That a, that a lot of them were, were, were seen as not, um, not, not good to fight on the Eastern Front against sort of fellow Slavs, so the Russians, etc. But there was a great, there seemed to be a big hatred of, of basically Italy within the whole of the empire. So most Austro-Hungarian troops that you sent to the Italian Front would fight the Italians very hard. But I'm sure in the, in the, in the bloody terrible conditions in the mountains in Italy, um, that that sort of activity must have gone on and the british certainly instituted live and let live. when the british and french troops went to um italy in 1917 there were definitely live and let live um actions going on between the austrians and the british and french troops on that front as well uh, alan uh, I, can i ask you just one more question from the audience uh the online audience and then we'll get back to your um, your presentation because we have other questions coming in, but I want to you have more time to go back to your presentation. Um, from Lisa Philip Filippo, Lisa Lisa Filippo, 
were there official sanctions for soldiers and or commanders who partook in the Christmas truce? Maybe I mean, you kind of mentioned that, but it, can you say anything more specific about yeah. how I, people were disciplined? In, 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 in 1914, for the main truce, nothing really happened to anybody. There, there, there were a lot, of, I mean, all the, all the sort of sanctions come into place sort of after it's happened or during it when it's happening. So it's sort of too late to do anything. 1915, there is a there is some truce in now. The, the 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 guards, as in you know the regiments that guard the royal family, they truce with the Germans in 1915. It shut down quite quickly, um, and this is after there's been these sanctions about you know you may be court martialed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Two officers from the Scots Guards are court martialed. One of them is acquitted and let off. The other one is given a reprimand which will be put on his record and he's a professional officer. So this would, this would affect his promotion later in life. But General Haig basically wipes this off the slate because this man has been a really good field officer. So basically only two officers in the British army are censured about this, taken to court martial, and they're both basically let off. So really, although the armies talk a good game about punishing people, they don't do anything. So it's very, it's very strange. Yeah. Uh, okay, Alan, you, you go ahead. I've got a, a, another question coming in, but I'm going to hold that for okay. uh, after you. Go ahead and, uh, and yep. proceed, and then we'll, uh, um, we'll take a pause again. Go ahead. So, so as this truce now is, is sort of winding down, and 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 there is there's you know pressure to get the war going again. Um, what you find is that where the two units that originally truced are still facing each other two or three days after Christmas and the war has to get going, they try to do it by degrees. Um, they try to ease their way back into the war. And this is an account from uh, Lieutenant Cyril Drummond, who's an artillery officer. And this is how he eases the war back on, on his sector. He says, orders came through that fire was to be opened the following morning on a farm which stood behind the German support line. Our battery was to put 12 rounds of high explosive shell into that farm at 11 o'clock. As luck would happen, I was the officer who would have to do this. So I said to my friend Johnny, what are we going to do? The Germans will be in there having coffee at 11 o'clock. I've seen them every morning from my observation post through my telescope. So he said, well, you've got to do it, but we should go up to talk to the Dublin Fusiliers about it. I went up and saw Colonel Loveband, who commanded the Dublins. And he sent someone over to the Germans and the next morning at 11 o'clock, I put 12 18 pounder rounds into the farmhouse. And of course, there wasn't anybody there, but that broke the truce on our front at least. So this is that thing about we're getting the war going, but we don't actually want to kill any of these guys because they're sort of our friends over Christmas. So we're going to give them a warning before we fire on their position so they can basically clear out of the way. And then, yes, OK, then the war comes back in. And, it, and, it, and then it gets serious again. But that, that shows that that sort of friendship had, had sort of held together. Um, I mean, there's even accounts of the Germans asking for a second truce on New Year's Day. One officer relates that he took photographs on Christmas Day and the Germans asked for a truce on New Year's Day to see how the photographs turned out. So they can see who's in the who's in the photos and could they get copies? So it so it does show that they that they were tr they knew they had to get the war going, but the guys they met, they sort of saw them as 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 friends. So let's ease let's ease our way back into this. Um, I mean, the other interesting thing about who truces on the German side is of just about all of the units of the German army involved in this are not Prussian units. They are Saxons, Bavarians, Württembergers, etc. And, and that's interesting in that the British army always see the non-Prussian elements of the German army as more into the idea of live and let live and, and not being so sort of thrusting and, and sort of warlike. Um, and in fact, there's an account where a Saxon regiment is leaving the line just after Christmas following the truce. And one soldier shouts to the British, he said he shouts across no man's land, the Prussians are coming, Tommy, give them hell. So even within the German army, there was some sort of friction between because obviously the Prussians were the bulk of the army, 
the German emperor was also king of Prussia. So there was this little bit of agitation between the Prussians and the other elements of the German army, which I, I think is quite interesting as well. Um, we saw in that what, one thing that people think about the Christmas truce is, is, is football. And football in the Christmas truce is a bit of a myth. There are very few accounts from both sides which corroborate that football actually took place. Most of them say, oh, the Germans asked if we could play football, but nobody had a ball or our officer said, no, you, we can't. We can't play with the opposite, with the enemy, etc. Or there are accounts which says the Germans came out of their trenches, we came out of our trenches, and we kicked a ball around. But that could mean we could mean just the British kicked a ball around. There are only a couple of accounts where it definitely says both sides played football. They're German and British accounts of the same place. Um, this football, this this photograph you can see here. Has, has popped up online on many forums. It was even used by the Royal British Legion on its Christmas card this year as supposedly a photograph of football in the Christmas truce. Now, there's two problems with this. One is this is a photograph of all British, they're all British soldiers here, there's no Germans. So, and also, secondly, this is actually when it was taken. It is Christmas, but it's 1915 and it's in Greece. So it's, it, it's, it's a totally false photograph, but this photograph has come up for the last four, five, six years. And no matter how often historians say, this is not the Christmas truth, it's, it still comes up and it still gets used. So if you see it, you now know that this was taken in 1915 in Greece and it's British soldiers, not um, Thanks, th thanks for that fact checking, yeah. <laughs> And um, I've just got one more little story about the, the Christmas truce recently. Um, you can see here a, a photograph of British and German soldiers. This is, this is a, a, a British photograph. And we, we know who the two British soldiers are in this picture. But in 2018, we were contacted by a lady in Germany who said, actually, one of the German soldiers in this photograph is my great granddad, because I saw this photograph on a TV documentary in Germany, and she then sent us the portrait photograph, which, which, which is next, which you can also see on the screen. And you can you can see the, the, the man second from the left. It's definitely the same guy. I mean, we have lots of people approaching our museum saying, oh, I've seen my granddad in one of your photographs. And quite often it, it, it isn't. You can see the, you know, they, they'll send a picture of their relative in and it's obviously a different guy. But this is spot spot on the right bloke. So this is it's, it's, it's brilliant. So we, we now have the name of one of the Germans in our Christmas truce photograph, which which was a first for us. Um, and and the, and the lady um, who, who gave us the information has actually donated the original photographs of her great grandfather to the Imperial War Museum. So they're now in the archive um, alongside the photograph of, of uh, her great granddad in, in the Christmas truce. So it's a brilliant little um, little story. It's great to show that when you get these archive um images etc out there to the public you never know what information is going to come back in to the museum and sort of slot another slot another piece of the jigsaw puzzle in place so it's, it was really really nice little story that one um if we look away from you know the i think another thing if we look at the christmas trees was that um, they 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 swapped. They had a lot of things to swap. They had lots of you know food, cigarettes, cigars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that was because the the armies were were actually giving the troops Christmas gifts, um, and also they were receiving this stuff from home as well. So they had a lot of stuff to trade at Christmas, which wouldn't have been the same at other points of the year. Um, for the British. Um, Obviously, receiving um, things from home was 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 sort of very popular, and um, there was one soldier who, in particular, wrote home about his um, his cake that he received from his sister, and he said the following: "This is in 1916, and this man was in the, was in Greece, so he's up in the in the country between what's now the border with Greece and North Macedonia." 
and he said, thank you very much, my dears, for your many presents and all the trouble you have taken to brighten up my Christmas time. What a wonderful cake that is. It is quite perfect. There are two classes of cake in the world, those that you make and other cakes. Morton and Irwin both had so-called Christmas cakes, and although they were good, they were not fit to be seen in the same trench to mine. I cut the cake first on Thursday as Morton had to go up to the trenches on the, on the following day. And I said to him, it would be much better if he had some of my cake in, in his insides. We also made our first batch of mince pies on Thursday and the second tonight. Wits made a great success of the pastry, so they too were top hole. So this is, this is that thing, you know, it's amazing to think you're in the wilds of sort of the Balkans and you can still get a cake, a, a, a fruit cake sent from your sister. Um, now the problem is, of course, these cakes were going a lot across large parts of the world, taking a long time to get to places. So sometimes they didn't turn up in particularly good condition or even edible. And one instance of this is uh, a cake received by Private Frederick Goldthorpe, who was in Mesopotamia, so Iraq. And uh, this cake reached him when they were really short of food, and he and he. And this is what he um, remembered in his memoirs. He said, during the evening, a boat arrived in the camp, bringing our first mail to us for many weeks. A parcel was addressed to me and we gathered round as I hurriedly tore off the wrapping. There was a large cake and it was eagerly divided up and each man took a huge bite. Alas, it was our unlucky day. In the darkness, we had overlooked a large tablet of scented soap, which had been packed with the cake. The resultant flavour after three or four months in close proximity was too much, even for our hardened stomachs. So occasionally, um, the person sending out the cake hadn't really thought about what to pack with it, and putting soap and cake in the same container was probably not a great idea. Um, but, you know, amazingly, this stuff was still getting out to people. Um, commercially, there was lots of commercial opportunities Big department stores in London, Harrods, Fortnum Mason, Selfridges started to put, have war comforts departments where people could go. And in one big room, had all of the stuff was laid out, all of the food, all of the equipment, gifts you could send to a soldier were all laid out that you could go in and purchase them. If you couldn't put, if you couldn't do that yourself, they started to uh, make up uh, pre-packed boxes of food and comforts. And they had different boxes for people serving on the Western Front, people serving in the Middle East, and even for uh, prisons of war. Um, so, I, you know, that doesn't, doesn't Alan? I, you know, yeah. one thing that just comes to mind. I saw that uh, in your in your uh, visuals earlier today, and I thought, this is advertising. Isn't this a little bit cynical commercialism here, or not? Um. Yes, I suppose the, the, the companies would call it um, good, well, good, good, good marketing. And also, um, I suppose it, it was, it was, they would see it as pa help, pa patriotically helping the soldiers in the front line by making it easier for their relatives to purchase goods. I'm sure that's win-win. Win. <laughs> um, um, I mean, um, I mean ha Harrods, Harrods had actually done, Harrods were ahead of the game because they'd done this in, in the Boer War in South Africa, 1900. One of the Harrods family was an officer in the London Imperial Yeomanry, and he had gifts sent out to all of the men in his regiment. So sort of Harrods had a, had a sort of almost a ready-made um, working model of this to take off the shelf in 1915. And, you know, let's face it, you know, if, if, if you're running a commercial company, you're, you're, you're going to, you, you know, you, and there's a long walk, you're going to, you're going to try to make some money out of it. Um, I mean, you know, the, these boxes, you know, they're not, they're not massively expensive. So most people could afford these, but, but some of the more expensive ones were really for officers, officers only, I think you, you would say. Uh, I mean, I think most people going shopping in Harrods have to be of a particular class to go there in the first place. So it was it was a bit of a niche market, but um, but the system the system worked very well, and I'm sure you know people benefited from from receiving this stuff, even if if Harrods benefited commercially from selling it in the first place. <laughs> um, 
I mean, there are also other associations, um, regimental associations, local councils, um, and even um, town councils and organisations in allied countries sent British soldiers gifts at Christmas time as well. Gifts or money. Um, regimental associations would send money so that, the, that so that their particular regiment could have uh, a Christmas meal could be bought for the soldiers. In 1917 in Italy, the Italian Touring Club gave British soldiers a Italian English dictionary, a pocket book for making notes, some chocolate um, and a bar of soap. I mean, I don't know if the bar of soap meant the Italians thought the British soldiers smelt, but um, uh, it was a it was a very nice gesture and and about 10, I think 10 soldiers, an officer and an NCO from each regiment were picked and went to the nearest Italian town where a representative of the Italian touring club uh, presented these gifts to to the individuals. So a very nice uh, thing to receive from your allies and it shows and, it, and it's sort of showing that, you know, you're in our country defending us, trying to liberate us. And this is a little gift we can give to you at, at, at Christmas. So again, a little good morale builder and a good thing for sort of inter-allied uh, relations as well. Alan, uh, is this a good moment to take another pause yep. and take a few more questions? Uh, this is, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and anyone in the audience here at the House of European History, if you have a question, um, Pengen can bring you the microphone. Uh, uh, Blondine has sent me uh, a few more questions try to get to a couple of them uh, before we go on. And we have 30 minutes left, so we want to make this count. How, this is from um, Takis Gritz Perisilis. How did the soldiers create a decoding system in personal letters if the officers censored them? Kind of explain that. Maybe you can give another example of how they how people right. got well, the censors. Well, I mean, I mean, the officers, the officers are censoring these letters, but if you are spelling out the name of a of a town and you're spelling it and you're spelling it out just in an ordinary sentence which says something along the lines of i'm 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 very well how is everybody at home and you you've you know these codes are worked out when somebody's gone home on leave so he, so this guy is saying you know within that sentence is every third letter the offer, his officer is not going to know there's a code so unless the, unless the officer is absolutely so intelligent that he can actually work that out, it's not actually going to work. And let me let me tell you, I know a lot, not a lot of army officers are that intelligent. Not even the intelligence staff officers. So, um, so so those those codes were were of, were was basically so hidden that it was it it would be impossible to decode them without actually finding out what the potential code was. Okay. Any. Are there any question in the audience at this point? Something. There's another one here from uh, in the YouTube chat. So uh, also those of you watching, please do send your questions through the YouTube chat. Uh, this, let's see, hang on a second. Well, talk is good. I'll ask another one from you. Uh, it's uh, you say it's an amazing lecture indeed. This brings me to a local story in Ostend. It's the coastal city uh, here from the uh, west of Brussels. Is it true that soldiers didn't know or want to know who the enemy was and slipped uniform to escape battle act civilian? Slipped it in uniforms to escape battle. Ah, oh, yeah. I guess maybe took off their uniform, turned civilian. Do you have examples of those? Um, not, not really British on the, well, not really British anywhere. I mean, there were deserters, obviously. Sure. Um, and, 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 and some people did disappear into um, the rear areas, but it, 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 it would have been different for, for, it would have been difficult for British, for British soldiers because most British soldiers, as in sadly, most 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 British people, they don't speak foreign languages very well. So it would have been very hard for you to basically pretend to be a French civilian um, because the first time you were questioned, it would be bloody obvious that you weren't. Um, lots of other nationalities did 
disappear. Um, for instance, in, in the Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, by 1918, there were, I think, something in the region of 100,000, if not more, um, armed Austrian deserters um, in the rear areas of the empire. And they were acting as what were called the Green Cadre. And they were um, supposedly um, na nationalist um, uh, if we're back, were freedom fighters, but they were basically people who were going around um, um, basically uh, robbing anybody and, and, li and living as sort of bandits in the rear areas. Um, there are lots of instances of Bulgarian prisoners captured by the British uh, who were wounded in, in hospital who basically ran off from the hospitals. And there are, there are orders from the British Army saying, um, a Bulgarian prisoner, they name him, they give a description of him, ran off from this hospital today, um, be on the lookout for him. But obviously the, the very mixed population in that, that part of the Balkans at the time meant that it would have been absolutely almost impossible to spot one, uh, you know, one um, probably unshaven Bulgarian from a local villager. So, but, 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 but these things did happen. So yeah, people did disappear, but, but not so much on the British side, because it would have been hard. We, 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 we were fighting in places where it would be hard for British people to blend into the background. Okay, Alan, uh, can maybe take another 10, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, do some Q&A at the end. Yeah. Uh, so whatever else you okay. can, uh, can present us in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I'll mention, um, this on screen, I've actually got I've actually got one here, an original one. It's um it's a it's the Princess Mary's uh, gift tin, and this was um one of the most famous uh, mementos given to British soldiers. And the idea was that this would be given to every British soldier and nurse wearing a military uniform at Christmas 1914. So that was two and a half million. Uh, personnel because this includes everybody in the empire as well um they are made of brass these boxes and there were uh, a smoker's box and a non-smoker's box there was also a box produced for nurses which included chocolate rather than tobacco because obviously they thought that it was it would be unseemly for for ladies to be smoking so they gave them chocolate instead um, and special boxes were made for Indian soldiers, which included um, a little tin box of spices um, and instead of tobacco for some of them, uh, there were more um, sweets. Um, Gurkhas, however, just had a smoker as a smoker's box because they don't have any 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 religious problems with anything. But um, so the idea was to produce all these boxes, but they couldn't produce two and a half million of them by Christmas. They did manage to produce 426,700 of them and distribute those by Christmas Day, 1914, which is pretty impressive. Um, the other boxes uh, were sent out subsequently. Uh, soldiers in Africa were receiving these in March 1915, so three or so months later. They were still turning up in the post, these boxes. Um, these were, what, these what were are, uh, Alan, what are uh, acid drops? The non-smokers got a packet of acid drops. Is that candy or something or what? Yes, acid drops are um, very sharp tasting um, small sweets. Okay, all right. Yeah, a bit like pear drops. Um, and a number of these, these, these were so, so, such welcome gifts that some soldiers just simply opened them up, thought, wow, this is fantastic. And then put them in the post, sent them home, and told their families to keep them with the contents intact. And you yeah, still right. find it, and you can still buy them. They're quite expensive now. We've got some in the museum with all of the tobacco and everything still in the tin. Did, did some of them use them? Did some of them use those for barter? Because um, again, another story I heard. My father was in the Second World War in the U.S. Um, Army Air Force. And he got, he didn't smoke, but he got a lot of cigarettes as part of the ration. And he used the cigarettes as barter to get other stuff. Is that, do yeah. people use their gifts like that? Yeah, yeah, very much, very much. People were swapping things around for, 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 for whatever they wanted or whatever they needed, definitely. 
Um, but yeah, these 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 tins are amazing. They, they only did them in 1914, of course, because when you think about it, that brass brass is needed for the war effort to make artillery shells, etc. It was so expensive that they couldn't afford to to do it in subsequent years. Um, if we look around at, at generally at, at, at food, um, you know, this is a time to really sort of, again, it's from a role boosting exercise for units to, to, to get that sort of um, inter-unit cohesion between officers and other ranks. The British Army made sure that um, the men all had a really good Christmas dinner, normally paid for by the officers. And there's a tradition in the British Army that at Christmas, officers and NCOs act as waiters to the men. So the men would sit down to, to eat and the officers would come around and serve the food and clear the plates away. And that, was a, that's a, and that still happens in the British Army uh, today. Um, you could also, of course, purchase, uh, you could go in where you were lucky enough, go into a local town, French town, et cetera, and purchase your own food for, for, for Christmas time. Um, other soldiers tried to actually rear their own uh, uh, livestock or poultry for Christmas with mixed success. Um, you had to guard them, obviously, because um, other soldiers would also want them and would, would try to steal the, the chickens or turkeys you might be uh, trying to get ready for Christmas. So there were obviously quite a, quite a lot of um, fighting and things going on over this and, and uh, people trying to sneak in and steal the, the animals that you had. Mm. Um, in, 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 in terms of alcohol, um, Alcohol, drinking alcohol obviously isn't encouraged in the army, uh, but at Christmas time, it was seen as a way again to 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 help with morale, and um, officers would 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 get stuff shipped in. There would be extra rations of beer, etc., coming in. Um, one drink that survived in in Burnley in north uh, north of uh, England is um, the liqueur Benedictine. And it's drunk. It's drunk with hot water. It's called it's called uh, Benny and Hot, and you can still buy this in Burnley in pubs and clubs in Burnley. And it's 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 a legacy of soldiers from Burnley serving in France in the First World War, where they got a taste for this drink, and then they brought it back with them after the war, and it still survives over a hundred years later in a in <laughs> enclave of of of, of uh, Lancashire. You can still buy Benedictine hot water. Um. Obviously, to take soldiers' minds off the war again, lots of entertainments to put on, concert parties. You have to remember the, the, the army in the First World War, it's a big conscript army. So there are people who are professional actors, people from the theater, world of theatre. They're in the army and they end up in these concert party units putting on pantomimes, musical reviews, um, and all of the stories are sort of tweaked to reflect life in the army so the stories change is there, there, there's a there's a story that i uh, heard about where there was a a singer from the opera de paris who came during one of those Chris, a christmas truce i don't know i guess maybe it was in 1914 and sang to both sides they stopped firing and that 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 singer that opera singer sang to both sides did you hear about that i no i've not heard of that one okay that must um, but yeah, I mean, it's, that, that, this is it. I mean, the there there were um, people. Yeah, there were there were people coming out who who, who were professional actors, etc. More that was a, a big thing in the for the British in the Second World War, where where we had this we had this proper concert party system. We had we had an, this um, ENSA system where we had people like Vera Lynn actually even going to Burma in the Second World War and singing, you know, to going up to the front line and singing to the soldiers and things. Uh, it wasn't that well organised for the British in the First World War, but it's mainly an, an in-army thing. So the army would set up its own theatres. I mean, in, in, in the Salonika army, the British army in Greece, three of the army divisions set up theatres, permanent theatres, just behind the front line, which would allow soldiers coming out of the line to go in, see a show before they, they went back to their, their camp. Or even you could even come down from the trenches, see a show and go back to the trenches ready for the next morning. So it was very much a way, again, a way to, to try to get back to normal life, a way to get away from, from the whole um, idea of war. Um, 
as we can see here, the, the famous pantomime horse from the from the Royal Flying Corps. Um, if you weren't into theatricals, there was also lots of sport. Um, always popular um, with the, with the British Army um, all year round, but especially at Christmas time. There was also uh, at Christmas a tradition of the officers playing the sergeants. And most accounts say the sergeants normally won. I can I can think the ser sergeants were probably um, harder players than the officers, um, especially at football. Um, there were also other entertainments like fancy dress competitions, etc., being held by the British Army. Uh, it's all this idea is just to stop you thinking about the war. You're away from your families. Build morale up again. At a time when you might be thinking, you know, why am I here? I should be at home. Um, snowball fights. Uh, if you happen to be somewhere where there was a proper winter, um, quite often, again, officers were ambushed by the soldiers, uh, but it was all in pretty, pretty much usually all in good spirit. And they uh, same nationality, I, I yeah, take. <laughs> and, and sort of nobody ended up on a charge afterwards. Nobody got seriously injured. Um, but it's but it's all that sort of thing that went on. Um, again, helping out with civilians, it, it, you know, that involvement of civilians, when you think of the people you've left behind, so you've left your wives behind, you've left your grandparents behind, you've left your children behind, and if you're billeted with civilians in a civilian house, those are just the sort of people who are going to be in the house. So the soldiers would um, get these people involved with any entertainments, any any food that they were that they were preparing, because it, it again it made it more like a traditional Christmas setting with the whole family around the table, um, which which was very important for these soldiers. Um, where this got difficult, of course, was in 1918 when soldiers were on occupation duty. So you're not in a country where you're trying to defend them and liberate them. You're in a country where you're billeted on a German family, say, or an Austrian family, where they've been the enemy and they've been, then the propaganda has ramped up and, and you've been told to demonize them. They've been told to, to, to demonize you and worry about what's going to happen. But, but Christmas is a time when, again, people can come together. And I've just got a quick account here of a, a private George Watts who was billeted with a German family in 1918. And this is what he remembered and how Christmas brought everybody together in the house. He said, we went into our little back room and started our Christmas dinner such as it was. The folk of the house were having their dinner of meat scraps and potatoes in the main room. And the old lady kept coming in and wanting us to go in with them. But my mate felt a bit awkward and said, why don't they just leave us alone? But after a while, we went in with them. They, ha they, were have they had a Christmas tree and were trying to make merry. There was the old man of the house and his wife, four daughters and one son. I had a mouth organ and started playing the Merry Widow Waltz. They knew that and were delighted. They got hold of us and we danced around the Christmas tree. And soon we were all friends, not enemies. So it just shows that sort of that, that so Christmas has brought these people together, a bit of food, bit of music and you know it's the end of the war we and we forgot that that you know a couple of months before that we were we were basically trying to kill each other so christmas was that time again brings people together um the one thing i did say at the beginning of of the the, the talk and which i'll which, which 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 i'll finish on it'll be the last account i give is that idea about the British attitude that, that no matter how we might have slacked off during Christmas, the attitude of the British soldier throughout the war was we had to win this war. This war has to result in a victory against Germany. We can't let the Germans win. And this is a steadfast thing all the way through. So even though they're being forced to be away from home, which could affect morale, et cetera, they've got that in their mind. And, and, and Private Arthur Burke of the Manchester Regiment perfectly sums that up writing home to his family on Christmas Day 1915, and he said the following, I must write these special few lines to wish you all season's greetings and every happiness and prosperity for the coming year. I am very sorry I cannot be with you all this eventful season, such has never been the case before for any one of us to be away, but cheero, drink and be merry. I shall be with you in spirit and thought. 
Don't worry about me. I know where I should like to be and where I would be most comfortable. But I also know where I am most wanted. So I will be out here with the lads, enjoying myself, but thinking of you, dear folk at home. And I think that just sums up uh, the feelings of, of, of British soldiers, at least, uh, at Christmas time. It was, yeah, we'd like to be at home. It'd be much better, but we've got a job to do and we have to get it done. So I'm here with my mates and we're going to celebrate as much as we can. And we're, we're going to think about what we are defending at home, but we have to win this war. It's it's so it's so strange to me that that we're looking at the human side, which I always try to find the human side when I did cover conflicts myself, the human side of a conflict, and yet in 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 a conflict, it, there's a tendency to dehumanize the other side, and and so here we're seeing that human side of the conflict, and 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 talking about this Christmas truce again, is. Uh, doesn't it, in your mind, render so absurd the whole idea of a conflict? Well, well, yes, it does. I mean, I mean, the blokes on, on you know, the guys actually doing doing the fighting are, aren't exactly the same as each other. Um, they 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 just happen they just happen to be there, and they've got that job that job to do. Um, they got it, a job to do. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's always that it's it, it's that unwritten rule that whenever you you meet. Soldiers, soldiers always say soldiers don't get a choice where they go to do the fighting. They just get told that's the job they have to do, and they have to do it. Yeah, that, I, uh, that unfortunately is the way. That is what it is. That that is what it is. If you don't, if you don't have an, the problem with the, with an army is the, the an army has to be organised. Once you once you get to the point where your soldiers go, actually, what the hell are we doing this job for? that's when it collapses yeah absolutely this and, is, and we saw that we saw that in vietnam i saw it just yeah. last night on, on belgian television was the movie uh, born on the fourth of july with tom cruise where he's a veteran who was very patriotic and and found, and discovered the absurdity of the whole conflict and became an anti-war uh anti -war, yeah uh, uh, i mean most most of the time you'll you'll, you'll find that the, the the soldiers are not do are not really doing this for the politicians they're in the position, they can't get away from it. They're doing it for, for the bloke next to them. They're doing it for yeah. their mates. They've got to defend their mates. They don't they don't hate the they don't normally hate the people on the other side of the wire. It's just the fact that unfortunately they are the opposition. Yeah. So as long as they're see. there and we're here, we we have to fight we have to fight them. Um and 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 and, and you can see that that whole thing with, 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 with you know with a military is it's also in, in these countries that have like a revolution the people in power only stay in power as long as organizations like the military and police put down the population as soon as the populate as soon as the military start to think hang on a minute we shouldn't be firing on our own people here are we on the right side yeah. once yeah. once the, the 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 people at the top lose that the control of those forces, then they've had it. I mean, that's what happens with 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 Germany in the First World War, where the army in the end just gives up, and then doesn't will not defend the 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 monarchy in Germany, and 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 and, and the Kaiser is basically because the Kaiser comes up with a crazy idea that he's going to lead his army back to Germany, and he's told by his senior officers the army is no longer with you. Basically, pack your bags and get out of the country. Do we have any more questions? We have just a few minutes left. Yes, please. We have some questions from online as well I'd like to get to on the YouTube chat. This has been really an amazing conversation. Please. Hi, I'd like to if ask you... you can identify you, yourself for us, please. Yeah. Julie Samnada. Okay. I'd like to ask you about the use of the term British uh, as opposed to British and Commonwealth. And... Um, ask you a little bit about photographic evidence, because I, I recently discovered there was truth to the story that my great granddad threw away my great uncle's victory medal. In fact, finding the papers, I discovered he sent it back. Um, now, the pictures almost always show soldiers that look the same. Um, now, particularly the British Army, was composed of many elements. Was there an official policy on photographic evidence in taking pictures of um, soldiers of other 
parts of the empire? Yeah, um, there are very few. I mean, once it gets to 1916, um, all photography is, is under the basically what became the Ministry of Information. There are officially appointed photographers sent out to the different theatres of war. Now, there are very few of them. There are only about 16 of them on the whole of the Western Front. Um, there are only two in Palestine, one in Mesopotamia, one in, one in Italy, I think, and um, none in Salonika. Um, so these um, photographers are told by general headquarters what they will be taking photographs of. So GHQ tells them you will go to this part of the line and you will photograph these units doing whatever they're doing. The photographs then went back to general headquarters where they were then looked at by an intelligence officer and the ones that they didn't think should be published were then taken out before the photographs were sent back to London where they were then looked at by another sense of the ministry and then the ones that were allowed to be published went into the newspapers. So there was quite a lot of censorship. The Australians, Canadians and New Zealanders had their own photographers to cover their own men. And in fact, the Australians had a wider remit. The British was more of a propaganda thing. The Australians were trying, like the French, to do a complete history of Australia at war. So the idea is they took photographs of stuff they knew would never get in the newspapers, but it was taken for historical purposes. Um, there are plenty of photographs of the Indian Army, uh, especially in the Middle East, where the where the British Empire, the British war effort was was totally, almost totally reliant on the Indian Army to fight some of those campaigns. So they feature very heavily. Um, they do also feature um, South African uh, labourers, uh, the West Indies, British West Indies Regiment, although not much because, again, there are few photographers, so it really depended on, on troops being where the photographer was. Um, but there is film as well. Originally, there is official film. Uh, there's a really good film of the South African native labour called the Black South African Labourers cutting timber in France. Fantastic film of that. Um, so there is good coverage of, of, of the Empire forces, but yeah, most of most of the uniforms worn by by British and troops of troops of white dominions, let's say, are basically the same. So unless you're told the people in this photograph are Australian, if they're wearing steel helmets, not the Australian um, slouch hats, you, you, it's very difficult to tell. So it is, it is difficult. The, the, the troops do look the same, mainly because we have standard uniform. Uh, Ellen, I got uh, th about three minutes left. I got uh, at least two more questions I'd like to get to if we can. Right. Uh, since soldiers let their guard down uh, during that Christmas truce, did anyone take advantage of that to surprise attack their enemies? Um, no, but the truce wasn't universal. Um, 81 British soldiers were killed on Christmas Day, 1914. Um, there was fighting. Not, not all the units were involved in this. Um, and in fact, at least one British soldier was taken prisoner. He, he went across to the Germans with um, a couple of bottles of whiskey or something that he'd managed to pinch probably from an officer. Um, and he was he was he was he got to the trenches and the Germans and the Germans just took him prisoner. And that was it. And uh, his, his unit actually come over and say um, on Christmas Day, they say, oh, could we have Sergeant so and so back, please? And they said, no, we're very sorry. He's seen our, our, our positions. He's now a prisoner. He won't be coming back. Um, I don't think, I haven't heard of any actual um, attempts where one side was trucing and the other side pretended to and then attacked them. But yeah, there was fighting on other parts of the front and where people were killed. And as I say, one or two people were taken prisoner. Uh, okay, another question. Uh, this is again from uh, Lisa Filippo. Uh, one of the things my professors keep insisting when I study history and past historical events is that human agency and human the human factor cannot always be your main focus in research. But in events such as the Christmas truce, surely the human factor and human agency cannot be ignored for all the plans that were made for the war. None of them seem to have been foreseen how the actual soldiers would react uh, to the war lasting longer 
and to the romantic idea of war that still persisted being shattered. Reaction to that? It's not a question. It's more an observation. No, no. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with that. It was a, this was a spontaneous, this was a spontaneous event that that just happened, and I think it. I, I can see the you know, and and it's the Germans that start this. And I can see with the lights going up and the singing. It, it could have ended there. It could have ended there. The British sure. could have just clapped and gone. You know, that was very, very nice. You know, but but it but it just but it just got rolling. It just needed a few individuals, as you say, to actually go the next step, and it happened. 1915. Um, we've got to remember the war in 1914. This is still this is the tail end of old school warfare. 1915, by Christmas 1915, the war's got a lot more serious, a lot more nasty. The poison gas has been used by both sides. Yeah. Uh, the Germans have bombed cities using airships. So they've bombed Paris, they've bombed London, etc. The ships like the Lusitania, the liner Lusitania, has been sunk with over a thousand civilians dying. There are a lot less people in 1915 who want to be friendly with the enemy. Uh, propaganda is ramping up as well, you know. So. But, it, but live and let live, and things do go on. You find it in letters, 1916. 1916, there are people cha exchanging uh, gifts with the Germans in no man's land. Oh. Um, it, it still happens, uh, very small scale. It's normally individual units that are opposite each other. But, but, but live and let live where it's low level. Okay, you know, it, it's hard enough to, for us to man these trenches in the winter. We won't fire on you. You don't fire on us. But that, throughout the war, that carried on at a local level. So there's always that. That it doesn't matter what the men at the top want. If you're in the front line and it's and it's bloody terrible, yeah, you find a way to get through it. And quite often that is that is un, unspoken cooperation with the other side. Alan Wakefield of the Imperial War Museum. UK, thank you so much. Let's uh, a big hand to Alan, please, for those of us here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. It was absolutely brilliant and and very moving. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who are moved by things that you heard, the hashtag through the lens of, and we will make more of these here at the House of European History. At, histori at Historia Europa is the handle. Include and also go on the website, historia-europa.ep.eu for more information. And please come and visit. And we should do a, go and visit your museum as well. Your museums, there are several of them, right, Alan? But yeah, five, five different branches. Yeah. Well, we, we uh, hope to see you one of these days in person. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of you for being part of this here in the House of European History and for those of you online. My name is Chris Burns. See you next time. Bye, Ellen.